The Evolution of Mucogingival Surgery to Periodontal Plastic Surgery. Let's talk about not only the evolution, but also the history. 35 years ago, the emphasis was on function, not aesthetics. Surgical techniques were referred to as mucogingival surgery, which eventually evolved into periodontal plastic surgery. What is mucogingival surgery and how is it defined? Mucogingival surgery is designed to produce a functional result, whereas periodontal plastic surgery is designed to produce not only a functional result, but also an aesthetic result. Mucogingival surgery focused on three things. Surgery to deepen the vestibule, to address an aberrant frenum, and third, to create keratinized tissue. And this was the definition that was provided by Friedman in the Texas Dental Journal in 1957. Let's take a moment to talk about how keratinized tissue was created in the 1950s. Keep in mind, this was before any soft tissue grafting for the free gingival graft was done and this was used as a pocket eliminating procedure. This was a painful, slow healing procedure referred to as a denudation or pushback procedure. In doing this, vast areas of soft tissue were removed, leaving exposed eight to 10 millimeters of bone. And then cells in the periodontal ligament space would migrate over this bone, forming a scar tissue that functioned as keratinized tissue. Yes, you got great pocket elimination, but significant was bone was lost during the healing process. Needless to say, this became a dated procedure and is no longer done. Periodontal plastic surgery is surgery to correct anatomical, developmental, or traumatic deformities of the gingiva and alveolar mucosa, a definition that I presented in the Dental Clinics of North America in 1988. So let's look at the specific things on mucogingival surgery. Surgery to deepen the vestibule. Well, let's think back to 1957. There was a perception that a shallow vestibule prevented the uh, placement of the toothbrush in a proper fashion to really clean the teeth. Well, we know that is not the case. And so therefore, this procedure was no longer done. But there is a need for doing this. And let's talk about deepening the vestibule in a young child to prevent future pull of the frenum. We can see this central incisor is in facial version. There's no recession on that tooth, but there's an uneven gingival margin. And when that tooth is moved lingually, orthodontically, that soft tissue is going to rise. And Bohannon did a procedure, which he presented in 1963, which is referred to as the lead shot technique. And what Bohannon did, using a lateral film, he did a vestibular extension, but did not expose bone. And at the end of the procedure, he placed a lead shot and showed how much the vestibule had been deepened. On final healing, again he placed the lead shot, and because bone was not exposed, the vestibule completely reformed. So the technique was modified by Dr. Herman Korn to get a permanent deepening of the vestibule. So we can see that an incision is made at the mucogingival junction, and then we do a split thickness flap for about a minimum of five millimeters but the key thing is that we expose bone in the apical area. And when bone is exposed, this will scar in and you will get a permanent uh, deepening of the vestibule. And Korn, as I said, presented this technique in uh, 1962 and referred to this as a periosteal separation with fenestration, the fenestration being the exposing of bone. So here we see the pre-op view and then we see a post-op view uh, and we see the apical scar that is found and we have deepened the vestibule. We did get rid of the frontum, but now that tissue will be allowed to rebound 
and we will get complete root coverage. Another case, and we can see there's recession on this case. And after vestibular deepening on the right, two weeks later, we can see the tissue already beginning to rebound and cover that recession. And as stated earlier, when this tooth is realigned orthodontically, then in all probability, that recession will not be present and we will have an adequate zone of keratinized tissue on the facial of that central incisor. Another application of this is in the edentulous mouth. And look at this case, how severely resorbed this maxilla, maxilla is. And you will see later that the vestibular depth was only about seven millimeters. There's not enough bone to place implants up there. So what do we have to offer this patient? We go in and again, make an incision from hamular notch to hamular notch, again exposing bone in the apical area. And then we see the apical scar that has formed up here. And whereas we had a seven millimeter vestibule, we now have a 12 millimeter vestibule and that denture has very much better retention. So here we see the pre-op view on the left and the post-op view on the right. And there is a, uh, a video that this lady uh, describes being able, how stable this denture is, and she's even able to eat nuts. So you can go to the lecture on vestibular deeping and the single tooth implant to find out in detail exactly how that is done. Mucogingival surgery. The second thing that uh, Friedman described was to address the aberrant frenum. Prior not to 1940, it was felt that the frenum was the cause of the midline diastema that was found in children as the central incisors erupted, permanent central incisors erupted. But then Broadbent did a study where he found that 96% of children had a midline diastema as the central incisors erupted. But by the time they were 13 or 14 and all the premolars were in place, because of the mesial shift of the teeth, uh, only 4% of those cases still had an aberrant frenum. But more on that can be found on the surgical management of the mandibular frenum, as well as the classic reference of Broadbent's work.